We talked about auditory processing disorder. Mm -hmm. Why is there still debate about whether that exists? I don't know why the debate still exists. I think that part of the debate over auditory processing disorders has to do with theoretical, theoretical views on what causes language problems and what causes reading problems. There was a very influential researcher, Noam Chomsky, um, many years ago, started writing in the 50s, finished writing on this area, on grammar in the 70s. Um, but he essentially, essentially had a viewpoint that the brain is a black box. We can't really understand it and that we shouldn't try to understand it and that what we should do is measure behavior. And so rather than try to understand what might be going on inside the brain, which would be an auditory processing disorder, let, let's say, that might be a factor in reading or language problems. He said, let's just measure reading and language problems, or specifically, let's measure language problems, and let's teach what's missing. Hmm. And that's, that philosophy is more or less, I think, underlies the, the objection some people have to trying to understand processing in general. So is there, is there a general move towards acceptance? I think there is in the mainstream, yes. I think that neuroscience has taken over in terms of our, in terms of our um, viewpoint of learning and understanding that we can actually get into that black box and that getting into the black box might actually lead to more effective and more efficient interventions. And once you see something be more efficient, the people who are still cons concerned and arguing against it are going to gradually change. Now you talked about auditory training. Can you elaborate on what auditory training is? Well, auditory training's been around a long time. It, it was used um, primarily 20, 30 years ago for people who had hearing loss and had hearing aids fitted. And after a person has a hearing loss, sometimes the hearing aids don't have very good acuity. Mm -hmm. So you trained them to listen with their hearing aid, and that was called auditory training. Then auditory training started to be used with children. There's a woman who, whose name was Barbara Hodson who recommended forms of auditory training for children who had uh, phonological issues, for children who had problems with speech sound production, if, if it was perceptual. And she had children wear headphones or um, had the speech and language pathologist use a microphone to actually augment the sound. So auditory training itself has been around a long time. It's just a, a way of improving speech sound perception, but now we've taken it into the realm of auditory processing disorders in addition to um, hearing loss or in addition to other kinds of phonological problems. If it's been around for about 30 years, I'm surprised they didn't make the connection earlier. Do you have any ideas on that? Well, I think it was the purview of a field called aural rehabilitation, which means rehabilitation of hearing. And so that's not a large field, and there weren't a lot of people who um, knew about it or even had heard about it. It wasn't, it wasn't something that was ever popularized in any way. So I think you have concepts of ideas of ways to work on problems that were used in in universities, used in hearing clinics, but not used much beyond that. And now it's now it's being expanded because auditory processing disorders are being diagnosed in a much wider group of children.